Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Today's presentation is one of several that are being offered as part of ISU's Open Education Week programming. We invite you to attend the other presentations this week. You can see the link to our library news blog with links to other presentations in the chat. I'm going to add it to the chat box right now. So this particular presentation is being recorded and will be posted to the ISU Libraries YouTube channel for future viewing. Following the presentation, we will have a question and answer period where you can unmute yourself and ask a question, or if you'd like to post a question in the chat, I can read your questions during the question answers portion of the presentation, and our presenter can respond to those questions at that time. Let me introduce our speaker today, Dr. Gesina Hearn, who will talk about her sociology slash social work 5521 Families in Social Context course. And let me introduce her a little bit more uh, with her bio. So Dr. Gesina Hearn joined ISU in 2001, first as an adjunct lecturer. In 2006, she was hired in a tenure track position in sociology. Currently, she's a professor, professor in sociology in the Department of Sociology, Social Work, and Criminology at, IS, at Idaho State University. She received her PhD in 2006 from the University Erlangen Nuremberg in Germany, before she studied sociology, Dr. Hearn was a nurse. Her medical background influences her research interests, which are in the field of medical sociology, families, and qualitative research methods. So thank you all again for joining us. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing your presentation, Dr. Hearn. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so I got a stipend to develop this course um, from the library from ISU, which was very nice to get that time because it is very time consuming to redevelop a whole course um, with free textbook materials. Um, the course that I've been developing was, um, as Ryan said, sociology and social work. So it's listed in both programs with both, both prefaces as a 4,000, 5,000 level course, which means we have a graduate section in that course and it's an upper division course. Um, here's just a little bit of sort of, um, and we don't, I, I will not read that to you, but just sort of idea what this course is. Um, the course is often in other universities and has been at our university uh, it, at times also called simply family sociology. That it would, that's what it goes under very um, often. And really what it is, it's a um, description and analysis of current patterns and processes and dynamics of family life in the U.S. Um, but it is also because we're sociologists and we're also talking about how families um, are interrelated with other social institutions in society, like the education system, economic system, political system, and how they all sort of work together. Um, for this reason, I also look at um, comparisons, historical comparisons, as well as international comparisons to really contextualize family lives and family patterns as we see them in the US. Um, the course has several learning goals and they go along with the things that I just said. So it's about social institutions, the family as a social institution to understand that first, but also understand how it relates to other social institutions. Um, look a little bit at understanding the family from a historical perspective. So understanding that historically families do look very different. They also look very different in international comparisons. Um, we look at current status of the family, just uh, quantitatively numbers, what is currently going on, how large are our families, when do people typically marry first, um, how high is the divorce rate, et cetera, et cetera, how many children do people have, um, and then, of course, a little bit over time, too, um, we look at different subpopulations then because, of course, family patterns and proce processes are not the same for every group of population in the U.S. So we look at different racial ethnic groups, but also other kind of subpopulations that we have in the U.S. And then I have an element in this class where I go once I establish the basic concepts, basic patterns, where I sort of go through the life cycle of a family starting with dating, going into marriage or any kind of form of pa partnerships, um, children later on in life then, but also family disruptions, and then a whole section of uh, on family issues, problems that families could encounter, 
And I finish it up with something on um, some materials on family policies um, and how governments and states do support families in the US primarily, but a, li a little bit again also comparison from other countries. The course is structured as an online asynchronous course. I have taught this course for many, many years because I came with the expertise and we added the course in, in our department here. Um, and then we transitioned the course later on as an asynchronous online course to be an asynchronous online course. It's, an, as I said, an upper division course with graduate course sections. I typically have two, three graduate students in there that are particularly interested in family sociology. It is a required course for our concentration in criminology. We have a sociology with a concentration in um, criminology in addition to our general sociology that we offer here in sociology. And it is also a required course for the minor in gender and sexuality studies. It's an elective course for our sociology majors and for our social work majors. Um, my experiences over the years that uh, we also, I also have many students from other um, majors in this course. They come from across the university. A lot of health majors also take this course. The average enrollment before I revamped this course was about 80 to 100 students. So it got pretty good enrollment. Um, what I've used in resources in the past was textbooks. Um, and the textbooks were typically readers, so a collection of articles um, and then thematically organized uh, in the textbook. The textbook cost around $80. I was able to use the textbook for several years because these were sort of top-notch articles or just some conceptual sort of thinking pieces that really didn't change much over time. I also used government resources, primarily numbers from the Census Bureau, movie excerpts to illustrate concepts, video clips um, to further illustrate other um, ideas or international comparison, historical comparisons, and then articles, additional articles from newspapers and news magazines to touch on current issues that are presenting ourselves. So when I was um, faced with the idea of making this into a free resource course, I uh, decided to now go for scholarly articles. And I looked then for one to two readings in the form of scholarly articles. I looked um, for leading scholars in the field in family sociology or family demography or adjacent um, sciences. Um, and I looked for articles from research organizations that I knew would have a lot of current uh, data and current uh, descriptions of family processes and dynamics, for example, Kaiser Family Foundation, Child Trends, Urban Institutes, uh, Urban Institute and other organizations like that. Um, I continue to use government uh, materials that, of course, are for free for everybody um, and additional news outlets, magazine articles on current issues, as well as video clips. My plan was to compare and contrast to really kind of be true to the notion that the family in context, <laughs> that we need to take a look at that. But in order to better understand this, um, it helps to look at historically as well as internationally how families look different and work different in different countries and in different times. Um, I believe strongly in visual effects to illustrate concepts especially when you have an asynchronous course, students like to look at something and have pictures in mind. And younger students now are so visual with social media and the internet that visual concepts are very important to them. I wanted some interactive elements there to have students interact with each other because it is very hard to go through an online course by just reading and never interacting with anybody. Um, I needed to figure out how to evaluate their learning and so while I was thinking all of, uh, about all of this, I thought, well, what the heck, now I can revamp the whole course. <laughs> so I ended up revamping quite a bit of the course content and course structure, kept some pieces, but did quite a bit of different things. So then I took a good hard look at what should be added, amended, deleted from the current content. I changed the course sequence a little bit around. Um, I thought about how to best engage students and did some things different there. And then I did something, I changed something student, uh, something in student evaluation. Primarily, I got rid of quizzes. 
I do not like quizzes to start with. I do not believe in quizzes. So my idea was here to um, evaluate student learning more in an understanding and application kind of way, which means papers and discussions. Um, the, I need to click on this here. So my to-do list then for the um, OER course, the new OER course and the revamped families course was first I had to find cutting edge research articles. Um, I had to find newspapers and magazine articles on current issues in the families. I had to find the newest demographic data on families. I had to find information on families and family dynamics in other countries, which proved quite difficult um, to find good information, reliable information from other countries. Um, I had to find information on historical perspectives, and I had to, I wanted to, I didn't have to, but I wanted to add uh, visual illustrations, movie excerpts, video excerpts, images to each weekly, weekly section. And now it doesn't go on anymore. I don't know why. We... Okay, here we go. Um, so once I went through all of this, I needed to think the next step. Do I need to license my current material? Do I need the library to help me? Um, and I figured I didn't need it because the articles were free. I could access them for free. I could download them for free. They didn't, they, they would, were not copyrighted. The government reports are free anyway. The reports from nonprofit organizations, these research organizations were also not copyrighted. So I could also use those. Um, I needed to think about the interactive elements. I decided on small group discussions or group discussions in smaller groups with guiding questions, taking those questions from the readings and from all the newspaper articles and magazines articles that I post each week. And then I decided on evaluating. So the quizzes were out. Um, I decided to grade the forums. I decided to ask the students to use citations in the forums to make sure that they actually read something. Um, and learn how to cite and reference. <laughs> um, I uh, decided to use short paper assignments, a uh, couple, three paper assignments in between where you apply um, the numbers and the concepts. And then a final paper that I've used actually for several years, um, and it is always a very eye-opening experience for students, where they interview a family member about a family history. Sometimes, most often, they do their own family members. Sometimes they take some friends neighbors um, and have them tell them about the family history and then use that history and apply a sociological perspective to it to analyze what is going on in that family using the concepts, materials and knowledge that they just learned in class. So now I needed to go on with my to-do list. Um, a new syllabus had to be written up. I needed to create new PowerPoints for each topic because now I had new readings. I needed to put notes on the readings in each PowerPoint. I had to cite, add citations for the readings in each PowerPoint. I had to record new lectures. I had to set up the small forums, forum groups, um, then create guiding questions for the forum discussions that were weekly discussions. I had to create assignments that related to the new readings too. And I had to find images and post URLs for images and video clips. Here's a list of sort of the readings in progress, <laughs> and it looks quite messy. And any like Sandy, you will probably cringe right now because this is not correct. <laughs> this looks very messy, but this was my initial, you know, you find the names, you have the names in mind, you have some articles in mind, you have, and these are all links that are here. Um, that I just first kind of collected and put them in a long list and then I ordered them all around in the right way and formatted them the right way. So this is this alone is a whole lot of work here. Um, this is how it then looks and I just found a typo in this too. This is how it looks in the weekly schedule. So for example, when we go just to family history here, so I have the reading, right? Um, that is Stephanie Kuntz from 2015, Evolution of the American Family. I plan to record a lecture, but then I found a lecture by Stephanie Kuntz on exactly that subject. So I thought, well, that is cool. Um, you have the leading scholar in the field of family history. Why not have her talk to the students and the student listen, students listen to her while reading 
uh, writing a writing from her. So I thought that was very good. And I actually, as you see down here, I used it then for the next sections. I found so many good lectures from leading scholars in the field that were out there somewhere on YouTube, somewhere on some other channels uh, they, that I could just utilize um, as you know, recorded lectures instead of me lecturing, they were lecturing those big scholars and I thought that was a, actually a good thing. Um, I had some video here, as you can see, families in the past, so that's the historical piece, and I found some inter, uh, international perspective. This one was a Mexican family tradition and cultures, um, and also putting it in a very historical way, so how it developed, where it came from, but also how it looks today. And then I had for each uh, week, I saw a sec also a section on Moodle that I put in food for thought. Well, I have questions where people can think about, you know, what does it mean? What is this? So just kind of poking, prodding students to think about certain concepts and ideas. And as you see, I repeat the same thing on the other um, sections. The next sections all um, contain current issues. So then I found something that's currently happening that's relating to that very issue here, like for the example, diversity. Uh, when I first conceptualized this year last year, there was still all this, all the things going on um, with Black Lives Matter. So that was very current, very much on the mind of people. So I included this article here on um, Black Lives Matter and an aspect of diversity in family life that family, uh, Black families have to talk with their children, um, the talk. Here's the detailed list of readings that then went into the um, syllabus in the end. I divided it or, or organized it by topics and by each week so students could easily find it, but also have the correct citation for every reading available. Um, and that was very important to me because they needed to cite this later. And I didn't want to put it in these uh, small like weekly section descriptions because that would have been way too messy. So I included them in the end. Um, with the detailed information on each reading. Um, this is a bad picture, but this is how the Moodle section then would look like with a little introductory section. And then we have here the PowerPoints, the lectures, um, the recorded lectures, often, like I said, from leading scholars in the field. What did I learn about this whole process? There's a lot of free materials out there, overwhelming, actually. <laughs> but then again, the best articles are not for free. But you can look a little harder and then often you find them for free in some places where you obviously have to make sure you really can share them. Um, but often you can find them somewhere um, and they're shareable after all. Um, research articles are not for every level. So what I did for this class for using um, leading scholars and, le and research articles from research uh, journals is not for every level. So at the 4,000, 5,000 level, I felt confident that I could use those. But I got to say, my students have also commented that these are hard articles to read. Um, so these research articles are not for every class level. Really clearly, that doesn't work every, uh, for every level. I would not even say at the 3,000 level might be difficult already. At the 4,000 level, I would expect students to be able to wrap their head around it. But it is not easy. Um, one thing I learned, as of course everybody of course did, you know, once you change the text, you have to change everything. There is a huge domino effect that happens when you just throw something new out in your class, everything else sort of changes. Um, so when you change the readings, you have to change the PowerPoint, you have to change the lectures, you have to change the assignments, you have to change the questions, you have to change the food for thought. I mean, it goes on and on and on. You change the, the videos for that week. So everything really had to be changed. Um, and then, as I also mentioned already, um, what I found, you find great lectures by leading scholars on the Internet. That was, uh, to me, surprising that there was so many good lectures out there by these leading scholars. And I was very happy that I could use those. The final lessons that I learned is textbooks are a nice thing <laughs> for faculty. They're so nice that everything is there. You have all the links, you have resources, you have questions, you have food for thought, you have all this in place. When you revamp your class with a free source from scratch, uh, you need to do all this by yourself. Um, and my final thought, and this is a bit tongue in cheek, is now that I collected all these materials, I might as well write a textbook. <laughs> now that I did all the work. Um, 
But again, textbooks are uh, really, they do all the work for us. When you do that work, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of thinking, um, and it has a huge ripple effect to every aspect of your class. But it's also a good opportunity to change things around and make them new. Thank you. Thank you, that was really um, inspiring. So yeah, thank you for sharing your story of um, how you've done this with your course. How have the students responded? I imagine, especially with the videos and the other ways you've structured the course, um, have you gotten pretty supportive feedback? The students liked the class. Um, there was very positive feedback about the class. The few um, sort of, little bit critical were some people struggled with the text with these research articles uh, they felt they were a bit too over their head these research articles um, some people actually would have preferred me to lecture instead of the scholars to lecture uh, but it was only a few voices in, in regards to that and then some students would have preferred quizzes over <laughs> forums and and papers so that was surprising to me too but they thought quizzes was an easier way to assess their learning, um, where I felt like most people don't like quizzes and the stress that comes with a quiz. But again, it was only a few voices, but it was, you know, good feedback. Overall, it was very positive feedback. Um, people liked the class. They liked, they loved the inter international aspects, the food for thought, the current issues. So to really contextualize all the family issues, I got very good positive feedback from the, for that. Oh, that's great to hear that the quizzes feedback surprises me as well. But the, the fact that the more engaging approach uh, seems to have re been received warmly, that, that's wonderful to hear. Um, do any of the other people here have questions? I don't want to um, dominate the space. It, you're welcome to ask. Hi, Katina. Um, Hi, Sandy. I'm wondering if. Uh, you are the only one who teaches this course at the moment. Uh, no, I have. We have. I have conceptualized this course. I have put it together. I taught it last fall for the first time with free resources, and we have now somebody else in the department teaching it because it's actually taught now every semester because we have such um, big enrollment in that class. We need to teach it every semester, and I only teach it in fall. I see. And are are you? Um... Uh, uh, sharing your material with the other instructors? The other instructor gets my class and I'm actually usually, I'm hoping that they just continue using the class as is um, because I feel, I feel like it's my class. Um, right. uh, plus there's, you know, like uh, recorded lectures from me on there. So uh, I'm a little um, protective of my creation, I gotta say because I don't want this to be changed and like maybe get a bad rap at the end or something. Um, because, you know, I, I want feedback if students think, that, you know, something should be done differently. Um, but I usually ask instructors that are teaching the class to say my class to just leave it as is. Maybe change some of the timing around or whatever, um, but typically leave it as is. Because that also builds the enrollment or the reputation of a class. Um, if it's taught differently every semester, I think that would be difficult. Yeah. Oh, thank you. It's interesting. Thank you. So a couple other questions I had were, um, did you have sort of a biggest challenge that you experienced throughout the process? And conversely, what was your favorite part of the process? The biggest challenge, I think, was really to find the right articles and decide on the right articles. Um, and of course, you have to read all of them, you know. Um, and like I said, there is so much out there. Um, and then to come down and say, OK, I'll take this, you know, or decide on the current issue, which one I'm going to take, because there's also oodles of current issues out there or international perspectives. So it's once you get on the Internet and search for things, uh, there's a there's a you get easily overwhelmed and then to be able to narrow it down and say okay this is what really fits and this is what i really think would be good for students um, to learn and it would fit within the whole course structure and the whole idea about how the course is set up 
Um, so trying to narrow it down and, and just sort of making the decision, it always was like a hard moment, you know, it's like, okay, I'm taking this article, like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, this is it, okay, just decide and now we're here. Um, I think the most fun thing for me was to find these lectures that I said from the from the leading scholars and listen to those, but it was really uh, very, it was just great to find those. Um, and then I always enjoy the uh, the visualizing aspect of it, adding images, adding the right videos, um, and adding a little humor here and there, you know, um, because the main thing about families is people need to learn, students need to learn to step back sort of from your own experience of a family. And, and you do that, can do that easily with a little bit of humor, um, poking fun at families um, and family dynamics and with humor that works often quite well. So finding those visual elements, those little video clips that it might be a little humorous and just to get people thinking, but also being able to step back then through humor. That was that my would, part. Yeah, that's great. I would not have thought of that sort of pedagogical use of humor, but that's really fascinating. I think that's quite insightful. So well, I found actually some nice people, uh, pieces, not people, pieces from comedians on families and family interaction. And of course, it's also familiar to us, family interaction, and we all have our jokes and stories to tell. Um, but comedians have that nag to just put the truth out there and just twist it a little bit so we can look at it from a different point of view, exaggerate certain things, but it sort of hits the nail, you know. Yeah, great, great. Um, so yeah, again, thank you so much um, for thank your you. time and for all the insights that you've shared. Um, I'll ask one more time if anybody else has questions that they'd like to share either in the chat or aloud. I'm still learning that when it's um, remote, it's one has to leave a longer period of time than often you have to in person, so. Um, okay, well, thank you so much. The this will be it has been recorded and we will post it later on on the uh, library's video channel. So thank you all for attending and thank you so much for all of your insights, Dr. Hearn. Thank it's you. Very, very well appreciated. Thank you. Bye. Bye.